Thanks, everyone. Um, it's really great to see all these, all these faces in the room, uh, partners, colleagues, dare I say friends, all here in one place at the same time. Uh, I and my colleagues are here uh, on behalf of the rather large hardware engineering effort in, at Rigetti Computing. Uh, we're really excited to be here because this is stuff that doesn't always get to see the light of day very often. And we really want to hear from you what you think about it, uh, where you think you can provide value, and let us you know, ha give, have an opportunity to, um, to talk about the ways that we think we can help enable your work. So um, just as a starting point, um, hard, you know, Rigetti Computing uh, is a full stack quantum computing systems company, and we do a lot of hardware engineering. We do everything from the ship up. We have our own fabrication facility in Fremont, California. Uh, and that's you know a, a really getting to be a pretty large and professional operation, and we have a quantum computing center in Berkeley where a lot of our hardware engineering happens, where the chips come, they get put into fridges, they get connected, they get uh, get deployed to the cloud. We do all this because we are passionate about putting the best systems we can possibly make out there on the cloud available for you to use and for you to pursue your work. There's a whole lot of slow, incremental, iterative learning that goes on. And that's one of the things I really kind of want you to take away from this is just that it, it's a journey, it's a process, and there's lots of ways that uh, we think you might be able to, to, to plug in and help us, and we can help you. So let's, let's talk about our roadmap. Um, obviously, when you speak about you know, sort of how the chips have evolved, you want to talk about the number of qubits. But just to level set so we're all on the same page, I know this is, this is common knowledge to most people here, we're very firmly in the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing regime. What that means is we're not doing error correction. Every operation has some error rate. And that error rate is going to limit the depths of the algorithms that we can run. So when it comes time to talk about what the chips are that we've made, you have to think about this both in terms of fidelity and in terms of scale. And so we're going to, I'm going to plot here the, the two qubit entangling gate fidelity, the most important sort of limiting factor in most algorithms, and compare that with the number of qubits. So when we first got started with our hardware engineering effort in early 2016, we were way down here in the lower left corner, working at the few qubit scale, just figuring out how to make these, these, these devices, how to operate them, what our gate scheme was, and so our, our, our error rates are pretty high at that point. But in uh, June of 2016, uh, 2017, excuse me, we actually put our first system out there on the cloud for public use. Um, that, that was an eight qubit system. We called it Agave. And it had error rate, it had uh, fidelities in the low 90% range. From there, we sort of rapidly scaled up. We really wanted to see how far we could go with, uh, with this architecture. Uh, and that was the advent of Acorn, a 19 qubit system that we deployed later that year. Uh, but we did take a fidelity hit. And so we wanted to take some time at that scale and sort of climb the fidelity ladder, uh, which we did starting with Aspen 1 uh, for the, the, the following year, and iteratively with a couple of systems soon after that, Aspen 3 and Aspen 4, slowly bringing our fidelities up. Most recently, we scaled up again. Uh, Aspen 7 is the newest system. I'm gonna talk about that in a slide. Um, but really, the, the exciting thing that I, I wanna talk about with you today is, uh, oops, is this, uh, this oval here in the upper right corner, this, this yellow circle here, uh, the places that we're gonna be going in the next year or two. And uh, in, pr in particular, I wanna lay out what we think is the path to get beyond 100 qubits and above 98% fidelity in the near term. So a word about uh, our latest deployed system, Aspen 7. Uh, it's, uh, it's available for use now. Um, it went up a couple months ago. Um, it has respectable T1 and T2 lifetimes, I would say. Um, it has fidelities in the kind of mid to upper 90% range. It's built on a platform of four octagons in a row, so as many as 32 qubits are possible on this platform. In this case, we've got about 25 at any given point that are, that are in spec and available for use. We're really excited about this as a starting point for the next phase of our roadmap for various reasons we're gonna talk about. This is kind of the building block upon which we're gonna, we're gonna scale. Um, and in the near term, the, the, the big effort we're gonna be talking about is how to bring these fidelities up on these Aspen scale chips, these 30 qubit scale chips. An important thing, uh, of course, to point out is that 
um, probably, probably the best feature of Aspen 7 is that it's available today on Rigetti Quantum Cloud Services, as well as on the new Broadcat service on, on AWS, which is something we're really excited about. But I do want to take a step back. You know, these deployed systems are kind of just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about how we work and, and how these deployed systems come about, because there's a whole lot of stuff underneath them worth, worth discussing. So on the left here, is, you can kind of think of this as like an overhead uh, schematic of the, the layout of our, of our lab, actually. We, uh, we have about nine dilution refrigerators, each of which can host you know, a, a couple of chips. Um, Two of them, you know, at any given point, we have about two that are deployed on the cloud available for use. We might have a third one sort of um, in the wings as a backup in case one, something goes wrong with one of those two. And then we're constantly shuff, you know, cycling through more candidate ships, trying to find the next good ship to deploy. That cycle takes a couple weeks, and so we, we bring a chip up and we decide, is this good enough? Is this gonna be an improvement? If not, let's put a new one in. But even, even more fridges than that, are being, are being used to do just basic R&D, improving the designs of these chips, the architectures of these chips, uh, working on the hardware that we hook up to those chips. Uh, and we even have a, a fridge in Fremont right next door to our clean room to work on fab process improvements so that chips, you know, wafers come off the line, we, we cut them up into chips and we put them in the fridge as quickly as we can and learn as fast as possible. In general, we, we kind of think that the heartbeat of this work is this R&D cycle I have up here on the upper right here, where we design a chip, we fabricate it, we test it, we learn stuff along the way, how to improve the design, how to improve the fab process, maybe even how to improve the way that we bring it up and operate it, and we make another, do another round around that cycle. And every time we, we move around that cycle, we learn something. And slowly but surely, we get better and better at each step. And just to give you a sense of how important this is, the most important thing for us is making good chips to deploy for your use, but almost as important as that is this learning cycle. And so if you look at an actual the actual way that our wafers look. I've added some false colors here, but otherwise this is an exactly a, a picture of a, a close up of one of our wafers. You can see these production chips, you can see these Aspen chips with the four octagons, but right next door to them, literally you know, uh, you know, moving in line with them, are R&D chips that teach us things, that, that allow us to learn more about the fab process and the design. Um, so it, it, it's really a, a very large effort kind of underneath all this that, that makes it all possible. I wanna talk about one success story that, we're, that we are particularly proud of just to give you a sense of how this plays out in reality. So soon after we opened up our new fabrication facility a couple years ago, we said, you know, we really wanna make a conscious and intentional effort to raise the coherence times of our devices, the quantum coherence times, and in particular focus on the, the T1 lifetime. So superconducting qubits are microwave resonators. Uh, what limits their lifetime more often than not is just microwave loss. There's a photon in, in the qubit in the one state because you know, microwave fields like to interact with things that like to deposit their energy anywhere they can. Those photons can get lost you know, out to you know, lossy materials, oxides, you know, things we don't want on the chip. And so we need to do, in order to raise the lifetimes of these, of these chips, we need to uh, find ways to clean up the, the troublesome spots. So if you look at all the, the, the literature out there, people thinking about what the source of T1 loss is, the, really the main thing we decide to zero in on are the interfaces between the various layers of materials. In particular, the, the substrate to air interface, the metal to substrate, or uh, yeah, metal to substrate, uh, metal to metal, metal to air. All these things are really important in places where microwave loss happens where the qubit's lifetimes are limited. And so we took a look at our fabrication flow and we looked at every single place that uh, one of these interfaces is defined and identified places that you know, some, some fabrication step could hurt or help this, uh, this microwave loss problem. Then we made it a, a chip design, a standard design that we were gonna live with for a long time. And we made it, it looks like this, it's eight qubits, um, uncoupled, eight uncoupled qubits, designed in such a way that we know when we do CT1 times, it'll be primarily the fabrication process that's responsible for it, that the design is, is not gonna be the limiting factor, and we stick with it. We freeze that design and we make that over and over and over again. And then we look at our fabrication process and we, we write down a design of experiments. Figure out all the different variables we want to adjust and implement every single one of them in a new fabrication flow and figure out what happens. So to do that, we can perform some advanced metrology, look at materials, look at interfaces, uh, look at chemical compositions, um, just so we can sort of figure out what the cause and effect is of these changes. But the most important thing is then go and measure lots and lots of these chips and measure what coherence times you get as a result of these changes to the fabrication process. 
And uh, bit by bit, you know, we sort of figured out in this part of the process that this is the best one. Now let's move on to this next part of the process. What's, you know, what are our various variables? What are the things we can change? Okay, this is the optimum there. And slowly and surely and iteratively, our T1 times came up. Over the course of about a year, they went from being fine, respectable middling uh, up to truly state of the art, over 200 microseconds on our very best chips. So that was really neat to see. Um, and the cool thing is that because we have this, this fabrication facility where all the tools are there, they're under our control, we can take that fabrication flow and implement it right away on production chips. Coherence isn't the only thing uh, that matters. It's one element of fidelity, um, but there's a whole lot more that we need to do to continue to improve on our fidelities. And so to, to talk about that, I wanna invite my colleague up here, Nicolas Didier, uh, who's our, our lead research scientist on the QPU team.